Episode 671. Book Talk begins at 2 minutes and 43 seconds. Emma begins with Episode 649. Welcome to Craft Lit. The podcast for crafters who love books. My name is Heather Ordover, and I'm podcasting from where the Delaware River meets the Old York Road, New Hope, Pennsylvania. Episode 671, The Key. This episode of Craftlet is brought to you by our lovely patrons at patreon.com slash craftlet and our channel members over on YouTube at craftlet channel. This week, we would like to highlight the following patrons Steph Bowen, Susan, Sandy Lunsford, Tara Durazio, and Amanda Bronson. Thank you so much. We could not do this without you. Well, hello. How are you? Uh, I need to go lay down, but I couldn't not record today. I am so excited about this chapter. This is a chapter we've been working towards. This is the pivotal point of the entire book, and not just for the reasons that you think it is, because I did some digging and I have some intel for you. But first, the winner of Heirloom Knitting for our raffle back in August, all the way to go in August is Mary Kay. So Mary Kay, I have emailed you. You should have gotten that email by now. Let me know your address and I will send you a book. And this month, for the month of September 2024, we have the lovely book, Continuous Cables. And this is by Melissa Liepman. It is some glorious cable knitting. If you have never knit cables before, this book, I think, was my gateway drug. So it is good. And it has pretty things. So again, if you are interested in putting yourself into the running for this book, please go to the show notes for this episode, craftlit.com slash 671, and you can sign up for a Rafflecopter. And the link that goes to Rafflecopter is the link that will get you into the running for that book. So thank you. So I mentioned that this is the most important chapter in Emma. It is certainly the most pivotal chapter. Everything changes with this chapter. Uh, We've got all our chess pieces on the board. We may think we know where it's going, but maybe probably not so much. I have a voicemail or two. I think I got two that I, I want to play for you, but I want to play them at the end of the episode for reasons that I think will become clear at the time. So we do have some wonderful voicemails coming in with people who have uh, slightly different takes on some of Frank Churchill's behavior, so that's good. But for the most part, today's chapter, even though it is so important and so pivotal, there's really not a lot you need me for before we listen. You're going to hear a reference to a cold collation, C-O-L-L-A-T-I-O-N. This is a what Knightley had talked about before, cold meats, cold, it's nothing is served hot. That's all it is. It's, I've never heard that word before. The annotations say it's a repast and that's all they say. So I don't think there's much else to go into. You're going to hear the word stupid used a lot. And if you just substitute like gobsmacked or dumbfounded or incapable of saying anything reasonably intelligent, that's what we're talking about with stupid, not a person being stupid or not even necessarily acting stupid. It's just there. It's what happens to us all on hot days. You get a little meh. And this is described as stupid uh, several times in today's chapter. Don't forget that the word gallant, gallant, is often not meaning what we might think it means. It's not necessarily a positive thing. It does come up. It's not a huge deal, but just just a reminder in case you're you're picking up on it that yes, you are correct. I don't think any of us are mystified by the idea of chaperones for young women. Um, In this situation with our group that's going to Box Hill, Mrs. Weston would be the main chaperone. She would be the the one who is of a 
pr- proper age and she's a married woman and and that's great but she's going to stay with Mr. Woodhouse because reasons so under normal circumstances uh Mrs. Weston would be the chaperone but she's going to stay back with Mr. Woodhouse with Emma's dad because she's pregnant and and he needs a companion anyway so for her it's going to be a lot nicer to just go and chill with Mr. Woodhouse, who she loves, so it's it's easy. But that would mean that the next oldest married woman would kind of be expected to act as a chaperone for the younger unmarried women, who in this case will be Emma, Harriet, and Jane Fairfax. So just know that there's, of course, there's going to be a snide remark from Mrs. Elton, and it's just another one of her kind of smug, I'm the center of everybody's world, aren't I? Moments. Acrostic poems, I am sure you have come across these. They they used to do them in elementary school and stuff with kids all the time, where you take your name and you write it vertically, line by line by line, each letter. So H on the first line, E on the second line, A on the third line. And then each line of poetry has to begin with that letter. And it should be something nice about the person that you're writing about, ideally. I might write a very different poem than the one that is being referred to here for this person, but but that's fine. Takes all kinds. And quite literally, that is everything that I can think of that you might need from me. There's more on the back end. So I'm so excited. It's not a long chapter. It's just an important one. And you will probably want to listen to this again. So check the time code on your audio player, wherever you are, and be ready to come back to this point to to listen to the chapter again or the yeah the chapter again in this episode all right so let's listen to volume three chapter seven or chapter 43 of jane austen's emma if you are listening to your own version of the book please fast wind to 26 minutes and 58 seconds all right here we go volume three chapter seven They had a very fine day for Box Hill, and all the other outward circumstances of arrangement, accommodation, and punctuality were in favor of a pleasant party. Mr. Weston directed the whole, officiating safely between Hartfield and the vicarage, and everybody was in good time. Emma and Harriet went together, Miss Bates and her niece, with the Eltons, the gentlemen on horseback. Mrs. Weston remained with Mr. Woodhouse. Nothing was wanting but to be happy when they got there. Seven miles were travelled in expectation of enjoyment, and everybody had a burst of admiration on first arriving, but in the general amount of the day there was deficiency. There was a languor, a want of spirits, a want of union, which could not be got over. They separated too much into parties. The Eltons walked together. Mr. Knightley took charge of Miss Bates and Jane, and Emma and Harriet belonged to Frank Churchill and Mr. Weston tried in vain to make them harmonize better. It seemed at first an accidental division, but it never materially varied. Mr. and Mrs. Elton, indeed, showed no unwillingness to mix, and might be as agreeable as they could, but during the two whole hours that were spent on the hill, there seemed a principle of separation between the other parties, too strong for any fine prospects, or any cold collation, or any cheerful Mr. Weston to remove. At first it was downright dullness to Emma. She had never seen Frank Churchill so silent and stupid. He said nothing worth hearing, looked without seeing, admired without intelligence, listened without knowing what she said. While he was so dull it was no wonder that Harriet should be dull likewise, and they were both insufferable. When they all sat down it was better, to her taste a great deal better, for Frank Churchill grew talkative and gay, making her his first object— Every distinguishing attention that could be paid was paid to her. To amuse her and be agreeable in her eyes seemed all that he cared for, and Emma, glad to be enlivened, not sorry to be flattered, was gay and easy too, and gave him all the friendly encouragement, the admission to be gallant, which she had ever given in the first and most animating period of their acquaintance, but which now, in her own estimation, meant nothing though in the judgment of most people looking on it must have had such an appearance as no English word but flirtation could very well describe. Mr. Frank Churchill and Miss Woodhouse flirted together excessively. 
They were laying themselves open to that very phrase, and to having it sent off in a letter to Maple Grove by one lady, to Ireland by another. Not that Emma was gay and thoughtless from any real felicity, it was rather because she felt less happy than she had expected. She laughed because she was disappointed, and though she liked him for his attentions, and thought them all, whether in friendship, admiration, or playfulness, extremely judicious, they were not winning back her heart. She still intended him for her friend. "'How much I am obliged to you,' he said, "'for telling me to come to-day. If it had not been for you, I should certainly have lost all the happiness of this party. I had quite determined to go away again.' "'Yes, you were very cross, and I do not know what about, except that you were too late for the best strawberries. I was a kinder friend than you deserved. But you were humble. You begged hard to be commanded to come.' "'Don't say I was cross. I was fatigued. The heat overcame me.' "'It is hotter to-day.' "'Not to my feelings. I am perfectly comfortable to-day.' "'You are comfortable because you are under command.' "'Your command? Yes.' Perhaps I intended you to say so, but I meant self-command. You had, somehow or other, broken bounds yesterday, and run away from your own management. But to-day you are got back again, and as I cannot always be with you, it is best to believe your temper under your own command, rather than mine. It comes to the same thing. I can have no self-command without a motive. You order me whether you speak or not, and you can always be with me. You are always with me. Dating from three o'clock yesterday, my perpetual influence could not begin earlier, or you would not have been so much out of humour before. Three o'clock yesterday? That is your date. I thought I had seen you first in February. Your gallantry is really unanswerable. But, lowering her voice, nobody speaks except ourselves, and it is rather too much to be talking nonsense for the entertainment of seven silent people. I say nothing of which I am ashamed replied he, with a lively impudence. "'I saw you first in February. Let everybody on the hill hear me if they can. Let my accents swell to Mickleham on one side and Dorking on the other. I saw you first in February.' And then, whispering, "'Our companions are excessively stupid. What shall we do to rouse them? Any nonsense will serve. They shall talk. Ladies and gentlemen, I am ordered by Miss Woodhouse.' who, wherever she is, presides, to say that she desires to know what you are all thinking of. Some laughed and answered good-humouredly. Miss Bates said a great deal. Mrs. Elton swelled at the idea of Miss Woodhouse's presiding. Mr. Knightley's answer was the most distinct. "'Is Miss Woodhouse sure that she would like to hear what we are all thinking of?' "'Oh, no, no,' cried Emma, laughing as carelessly as she could. Upon no account in the world, it is the very last thing I would stand the brunt of just now. Let me hear anything rather than what you are all thinking of. I will not say quite all. There are one or two, perhaps, glancing at Mr. Weston and Harriet, whose thoughts I might not be afraid of knowing. It is a sort of thing, cried Mrs. Elton emphatically, which I should not have thought myself privileged to inquire into, though perhaps as the chaperone of the party— I never was in any circle. Exploring parties, young ladies, married women. Her mutterings were chiefly to her husband, and he murmured in reply, Very true, my love, very true, exactly so, indeed, quite unheard of. But some ladies say anything. Better pass it off as a joke. Everybody knows what is due to you. It will not do, whispered Frank to Emma. They are most of them affronted. I will attack them with more address. "'Ladies and gentlemen, I am ordered by Miss Woodhouse to say that she waives her right of knowing exactly what you may be all thinking of, and only requires something very entertaining from each of you in a general way. Here are seven of you besides myself, who, she is pleased to say, is very entertaining already, and she only demands from each of you either one thing very clever, be it prose or verse, original or repeated, or two things moderately clever.' or three things very dull indeed, and she engages to laugh heartily at them all. "'Oh, very well!' exclaimed Miss Bates. "'Then I need not be uneasy. Three things very dull indeed. That will just do for me, you know. I shall be sure to say three dull things as soon as ever I open my mouth, shan't I?' Looking round with a most good-humoured dependence on everybody's assent. "'Do not you all think I shall?' Emma could not resist. "'Ah, ma'am, but there may be a difficulty.' 
"'Pardon me, but you will be limited as to number, only three at once.' Miss Bates, deceived by the mock ceremony of her manner, did not immediately catch her meaning, but when it burst on her, it could not anger, though a slight blush showed that it could pain her. "'Ah! Well, to be sure. Yes, I see what she means.' turning to Mr. Knightley. "'And I will try to hold my tongue. I must make myself very disagreeable, or she would not have said such a thing to an old friend.' "'I like your plan,' cried Mr. Weston. "'Agreed, agreed. I will do my best. I am making a conundrum. How will a conundrum reckon?' "'Low, I am afraid, sir, very low,' answered his son. "'But we shall be indulgent, especially to any one who leads the way.' "'No, no,' said Emma. "'It will not reckon low. A conundrum of Mr. Weston's shall clear him and his next neighbour. Come, sir, pray, let me hear it.' "'I doubt it's being very clever myself,' said Mr. Weston. "'It is too much a matter of fact, but here it is. What two letters of the alphabet are there that express perfection?' "'What two letters express perfection? I am sure I do not know.' "'Ah, you will never guess. You,' to Emma. I am certain will never guess. I will tell you. M and A. M. Ma. Do you understand? Understanding and gratification came together. It might be a very indifferent piece of wit, but Emma found a great deal to laugh at and enjoy in it. So did Harriet and Frank. It did not seem to touch the rest of the party equally. Some looked very stupid about it, and Mr. Knightley gravely said, This explains the sort of clever thing that is wanted— and Mr. Weston has done very well for himself, but he must have knocked up everybody else. Perfection should not have come quite so soon. "'Oh, for myself I protest I must be excused,' said Mrs. Elton. "'I really cannot attempt. I am not at all fond of the sort of thing. I had an acrostic once sent me upon my own name, which I was not at all pleased with. I knew who it came from, an abominable puppy. You know who I mean,' nodding to her husband. These kinds of things are very well at Christmas, when one is sitting round the fire, but quite out of place, in my opinion, when one is exploring about the country in summer. Miss Woodhouse must excuse me. I am not one of those who have witty things at everybody's service. I do not pretend to be a wit. I have a great deal of vivacity in my own way, but really I must be allowed to judge when to speak and when to hold my tongue. Pass us, if you please, Mr. Churchill. Pass Mr. E., Knightley, Jane, and myself. We have nothing clever to say, not one of us. Yes, yes. Pray pass me, added her husband, with a sort of sneering consciousness. I have nothing to say that can entertain Miss Woodhouse, or any other young lady. An old married man, quite good for nothing. Shall we walk, Augusta? With all my heart. I am really tired of exploring so long on one spot— "'Come, Jane, take my other arm.' Jane declined it, however, and the husband and wife walked off. "'Happy couple,' said Frank Churchill, as soon as they were out of hearing. "'How well they suit one another. Very lucky, marrying as they did, upon an acquaintance formed only in a public place. They only knew each other, I think, a few weeks in Bath. Peculiarly lucky. For as to any real knowledge of a person's disposition that Bath or any other public place can give, it is all nothing.' There can be no knowledge. It is only by seeing women in their own homes, among their own set, just as they always are, that you can form any just judgment. Short of that, it is all guess and luck, and will generally be ill luck. How many a man has committed himself on short acquaintance, and rued it all the rest of his life? Miss Fairfax, who had seldom spoken before, except among her own confederates, spoke now. Such things do occur, undoubtedly. She was stopped by a cough. Frank Churchill turned towards her to listen. "'You were speaking,' said he, gravely. She recovered her voice. "'I was only going to observe that though such unfortunate circumstances do occur sometimes both to men and women, I cannot imagine them to be very frequent. A hasty and imprudent attachment may arise, but there is generally time to recover from it afterwards. I would be understood to mean that it can only be weak, irresolute characters— whose happiness must be always at the mercy of chance, who will suffer an unfortunate acquaintance to be an inconvenience, an oppression for ever. He made no answer, merely looked and bowed in submission, and soon afterwards said in a lively tone, 
Well, I have so little confidence in my own judgment, that whenever I marry, I hope somebody will choose my wife for me. Will you, turning to Emma, will you choose a wife for me? I am sure I should like anybody fixed on by you. You provide for the family, you know, with a smile at his father. Find somebody for me. I am in no hurry. Adopt her, educate her. And make her like myself? By all means, if you can. Very well. I undertake the commission. You shall have a charming wife. She must be very lively and have hazel eyes. I care for nothing else. I shall go abroad for a couple of years, and when I return I shall come to you for my wife. Remember. Emma was in no danger of forgetting it. It was a commission to touch every favourite feeling. Would not Harriet be the very creature described? Hazel eyes excepted, two years more might make her all that he wished. He might even have Harriet in his thoughts at the moment. Who could say? Referring the education to her seemed to imply it. "'Now, Mum,' said Jane to her aunt, "'shall we join Mrs. Elton?' "'If you please, my dear, with all my heart. I am quite ready. I was ready to have gone with her, but this will do just as well. We shall soon overtake her. There she is. No, that's somebody else. That's one of the ladies in the Irish car party, not at all like her. Well, I declare—' They walked off, followed in half a minute by Mr. Knightley. Mr. Weston, his son, Emma, and Harriet only remained, and the young man's spirits now rose to a pitch almost unpleasant. Even Emma grew tired at last of flattery and merriment, and wished herself rather walking quietly about with any of the others, or sitting almost alone, and quite unattended to, in tranquil observation of the beautiful views beneath her. The appearance of the servants looking out for them to give notice of the carriages was a joyful sight, and even the bustle of collecting and preparing to depart, and the solicitude of Mrs. Elton to have her carriage first, were gladly endured, in the prospect of the quiet drive home, which was to close the very questionable enjoyments of this day of pleasure. Such another scheme, composed of so many ill-assorted people, she hoped never to be betrayed into again. While waiting for the carriage, she found Mr. Knightley by her side— he looked around, as if to see that no one were near, and then said, "'Emma, I must once more speak to you as I have been used to do, a privilege rather endured than allowed, perhaps, but I must still use it. I cannot see you acting wrong without a remonstrance. How could you be so unfeeling to Miss Bates? How could you be so insolent in your wit to a woman of her character, age, and situation? Emma, I had not thought it possible.' Emma recollected, blushed, was sorry, but tried to laugh it off. "'Nay, how could I help saying what I did? Nobody could have helped it. It was not so very bad. I dare say she did not understand me.' "'I assure you she did. She felt your full meaning. She has talked of it since. I wish you could have heard how she talked of it, with what candour and generosity. I wish you could have heard her honouring your forbearance, in being able to pay her such attentions, as she was forever receiving from yourself and your father, when her society must be so irksome. Oh, cried Emma, I know there is not a better creature in the world, but you must allow that what is good and what is ridiculous are most unfortunately blended in her. They are blended, said he. I acknowledge, and were she prosperous, I could allow much for the occasional prevalence of the ridiculous over the good. Was she a woman of fortune, I would leave every harmless absurdity to take its chance. I would not quarrel with you for any liberties of manner. Was she your equal in situation? But, Emma, consider how far this is from being the case. She is poor. She has sunk from the comfort she was born to, and if she lived to old age must probably sink more. Her situation should secure your compassion. It was badly done, indeed. You, whom she had known from an infant— whom she had seen grow up from a period when her notice was an honour, to have you now in thoughtless spirits and the pride of the moment laugh at her, humble her, and before her niece too, and before others, many of whom, certainly some, would be entirely guided by your treatment of her. This is not pleasant to you, Emma, and it is very far from pleasant to me. But I must, I will, I will tell you truths while I can, satisfied with proving myself your friend by very faithful counsel, and trusting that you will some time or other do me greater justice than you can do now. While they talked, they were advancing towards the carriage. It was ready, and before she could speak again, he had handed her in. He had misinterpreted the feelings which had kept her face averted, and her tongue motionless. They were combined only of anger against herself, mortification, and deep concern. She had not been able to speak, and on entering the carriage, sunk back for a moment overcome. 
then reproaching herself for having taken no leave, making no acknowledgment, parting in apparent sullenness, she looked out with voice and hand eager to show a difference, but it was just too late. He had turned away, and the horses were in motion. She continued to look back, but in vain, and soon with what appeared unusual speed they were halfway down the hill, and everything left far behind. She was vexed beyond what could have been expressed, almost beyond what she could conceal. Never had she felt so agitated, mortified, grieved at any circumstance in her life. She was most forcibly struck. The truth of this representation there was no denying. She felt it at her heart. How could she have been so brutal, so cruel to Miss Bates? How could she have exposed herself to such ill opinion in any one she valued? And how suffer him to leave her without saying one word of gratitude, of concurrence, of common kindness? Time did not compose her. As she reflected more, she seemed but to feel it more. She had never been so depressed. Happily it was not necessary to speak. There was only Harriet, who seemed not in spirits herself, fagged and very willing to be silent, and Emma felt the tears running down her cheeks almost all the way home, without being at any trouble to check them, extraordinary as they were. End of chapter 7 Okay. I want to start by playing Leanne's voicemail from last week, because it leads in very nicely to this week. So let's listen to Leanne before we talk about any more of today's chapters. Hi, Heather. It's Leanne in Oregon um, from the Thursday Night Crew. I just got caught up listening to chapters or episode 669 from Emma. And I had a little bit different take on the whole Frank Churchill spelling out the word Dixon for Jane. Um, I've always felt like he thinks he's, you know, this kind of wag that lives on the edge. And he is constantly kind of pushing the social norms with Emma about teasing Jane, about things you're not supposed to do. And, and you know, should I spell it? Should I do this? Should I do, do you dare me? I mean, you can almost hear it in his voice. And she's laughing and saying no, but she's not really seriously saying no, you really shouldn't do that. That's not polite. You know, she's, she's, she's falling off the edge of those norms too. Uh, that Emma thinks that she is in love with Mr. Dixon and that this whole thing is just a really funny story to him that Emma is so mistaken about what's going on. And so this is his way to poke Jane about it, too, because I'm sure she doesn't think it's very funny. That's like, ew, ick. That's my friend's husband. But this way he can be that, you know, that wag who lives on the edge and he can poke Emma and he can poke Jane and he can make fun of all this stuff and he can get away with it because he thinks he's being sly and and smart and it's I, I don't know it's just kind of always the way I've I've taken that that particular word when he spells it out so anyway I'm sure there are a lot of other possibilities too uh sorry I missed the discussion on Sunday but I will see you guys next Thursday thanks bye so Frank Churchill is being a pill to quote my mother who never said a bad thing about anyone in her life. But Pill, Pill and Clunk were, boy, you were in the doghouse if that was aimed at you. So Frank's being a pill. And it's kind of the continuation of his crankiness from the day before when he was hot. Now he's saying he's not hot, but he really is being kind of poking at you, poking at you, poking at you, obnoxious all the way through this chapter. It really does do a bad job of setting Emma up for being glib because she's kind of matching Frank. And since he's the only entertainment, quote unquote, entertainment right there right now, it kind of ramps up her worst instincts, as you have seen. And and I think one of the reasons that I say that, that I don't, I don't know that Emma would have uh, said what she said if she wasn't in this kind of trying to be easygoing, trying to be jovial, trying to be life of the party to get people going. She stuck her foot in it before she thought. I think the important line, and it is just a single paragraph that is one sentence, and that sentence is, Emma could not resist. Being clever. 
which we've talked about. Clever is not always a really good thing. Clever, handsome, and rich. Well, here Clever gets her in big, fat, honking trouble. So when she criticizes Miss Bates with, you're going to have to limit yourself to three stupid things. In the movie versions, there's often a, the very first immediate response from Miss Bates, which is in the text, when she's, ah, well, to be sure, yes, I, I see what she means, turning to Mr. Knightley, and that's in parentheses in the book. And I will try to hold my tongue. I must make myself very disagreeable, or she would not have said such a thing to an old friend. That is almost always immediately following Emma's insult. But the pain of what's going on in the book takes a lot longer for Emma to key into. And I I know in the Gwyneth Paltrow version, and I think also in the um, Anya Taylor-Joy, there's a, a flash that goes across the face. I think it takes longer in Anya Taylor-Joy, which is closer to the book. But there's a flash that goes across their face of like some, uh, that did not land right. But then they they're being egged on and used to being the center of attention and the person who everybody looks to for being the hostess with the mostest, she just kind of keeps rolling on. Mr. Weston, as we have noted before, love him to death, but not always good at picking up social cues. So Mr. Weston thinks, well, everybody is is being kind of down and, and dopey, so I'm going to try and cover the situation, especially now that Miss Bates has been insulted. I'm going to try and pick the conversation up and uh, give you a conundrum. We have talked before about this. Jane Austen and her family loved a conundrum, never met a conundrum or a pun they didn't like. The layers of meaning in this conundrum that Mr. Weston makes are many, and I am really only going to focus on one of them. It's the one that I think is the the strongest, but there are other things going on here. And I am going to link out to two articles. One is a blog post and one is a, a I think it's a journal article from Stanford. The blog post is is interesting. He's kind of a conspiracy theorist when it comes to Jane Austen. Like he thinks Jane Fairfax is pregnant stuff like that. He thinks he's he's cracked the code. I don't know if he has or not. I haven't read all of his blog. I had to I had to stop reading the blog because I needed to get on with the rest of the research. But uh but he has an interesting write up about this particular scene. So I'll be linking out to that blog. And then uh, the Stanford paper I am linking out to it is a whole long multi-sectioned work on Francis Hutchison. And I actually, this is one of those days where watching the YouTube is going to make you happier because I had to make some slides in order to make sense to myself. This is that whole teachers only really understand something to teach when they've had to teach it themselves, which is why it's a really good idea to get students to have to teach something every once in a while to the rest of the class. So I have slides (laughs) and I hope this helps because it, Francis Hutchison was a philosopher. So here we go. All right. So the secret key to Emma, Francis Hutchinson, whose name I may have actually misspelled. It may be F-R-A-N-C-I-S. It may have autocorrected. Anyway, Francis Hutchison lived from 1694 to 1746. And anybody who was on the Scotland trip for the Craftlet Scotland trip with Diane may remember that we drove by Glasgow University and they had these beautiful wrought iron gates at the front. And all these names were up there, David Hume, well, the last names, David Hume and uh, Adam Smith, a bunch of really, really important philosophers went to school there all around the same time, kind of proto-enlightenment into enlightenment thinkers. So a lot of science and a lot of philosophy. I do not understand why Francis Hutcheson is not better known outside of philosophical circles. He seems to be quite well known within them, but outside of them, I had never heard of this guy before, which is kind of a shame because my last name before I got married was kind of close to this and I could have totally 
owned it. <laughs> like, yes, they changed the spelling of our name after we moved here. If you haven't watched The Good Place before, now is an excellent time after today's episode. It's an excellent time to start watching The Good Place because this guy's take on philosophy and virtue and morality is fascinating. And if you have watched some of The Good Place or all of The Good Place, your bells are going to be ringing. Some some of this stuff is going to just click right into place for you. So, Francis Hutchison, what does this have to do with Emma? This is that weird, cryptic conundrum that Mr. Weston shares. The I will tell you the the two two things, two letters that express perfection. M and A, Emma. And that has never made any sense to me. You kind of smile and nod and go, yeah, okay. It's like reading Dostoevsky and just going, oh, it's another guy with an R name or a D name. And you move on. I had never paid much attention to this. Now I have. And here's the cool part. Francis Hutchison decided to uh, determine how to calculate happiness. And for him, the greatest happiness for the greatest number of people was the the pinnacle. That was your hope. That's what you that is what you want to aim for. The most happy for the most people. The end. Which he came up with a way to calculate mathematically, which just kills me. It's oh my God, these guys. So the factors that go into calculating moral goodness, and again, if you're listening to the podcast version, just the audio version, this is all on slides in in the YouTube version. The factors that go into moral goodness are first, the, the calculation is going to begin with our desired outcome, the thing that everything has to equal at the end, and that is a moment of good. A moment of good, and yes, there could be a moment of evil as well, and that does get talked about in his writing, but we're not going to go there. Just know that he's not just happy-go-lucky. He does actually consider the flip side. So you have this, this moment of good, which is the outcome you want. And in order to figure out the rest of that equation, you need to factor in benevolence, the state of benevolence. And the other factor is ability. And benevolence, you kind of go, well, how how do you decide what benevolence is. Well, Hutchison helped you with that because for him, the calculation of benevolence was the moment of good divided by your ability to provide it. So if you have very few means, but you are doing everything you possibly can, your moment of good is easier to get to. If you have lots of abilities, money, time, effort, and stuff, and you are not using all of it, when you divide that moment of good, you'd be dividing it into smaller pieces, which would not be as awesome. And ability is exactly what you think it is. It is your actions, the things that you could do to make things better for the world. And the the assumption is that this is something you're going to be doing for people. So the actual calculation here is a moment of good is equivalent to benevolence times ability. And again, benevolence is the moment of good divided by ability. So ability is all over here. You're not expected to be working super hard for the benefit of mankind if you don't have the ability to. Some people just need to be able to make it through life. So a moment of good is equal to benevolence times ability. So for Francis Hutchison, perfection of virtue, and the word perfection is important. It gets used in several different places. Perfection of virtue or a truly virtuous act is represented as a moment of good being equivalent to the ability that you put into it, where you act to the utmost of your power for the public good. And the recognition is that it's the public good. It's not an individual person. It's not like, well, I like you, so I'll send your kid to college. Even though you can't afford it, I'll, I'll pay for it for you. No, no, no. This is looking for the, the most that can be done 
for the most people, for the public good. And the, and the idea is for those two things to become equivalents. Uh, you want the amount that you can do to equal the amount that's done, which means if you reduce this, the moment of good M is the equivalent to your ability or A, which means perfection is M and A, M, M. This is where it comes from. Right? I know. It's not just a cheesy joke that doesn't make any sense. He's actually sub-referencing a philosophical treatise that was written several years earlier. And this is one of those places where the scholarship really diverges because some people are like, well, you know, it just indicates that Mr. Weston is a deeper thinker than we thought. And other people are like, no, 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 no. This is Jane Austen winking so hard at you, you should be able to feel the breeze. Because this is something she loved and something that she enjoyed reading about and writing about. And the chances of Mr. Weston actually knowing this are, I think, not that high. Not that he's not a lovely person, but just not not the deep thinker that you might need to be in order to pull this out of a, a hat. So again, if you watch The Good Place, you might start to think, okay, but how do you calculate how many people, you know, how much good needs to be spread around? Because if your ability to do good is very great, you have a lot of money or, or time or whatever, are you required to spend all of that on all of the people and put yourself into poverty? Is that the, the correct thing to do? And the answer is no. Francis Hutcheson was, I think, shockingly realistic for being a philosopher <laughs> at the time. He actually has further calculations that he recommends for figuring out, like, if you make yourself miserable in the process, then you have missed the point. You can be happy. Everyone else can be happy, too. It shouldn't be a zero-sum game. You shouldn't have to sacrifice your life for doing good, you can just do good as much as you can, reasonably. And uh, and he talks about that quite a bit. So the article that I link out to, which I have the link to is on the screen if you're watching the video, it's plato.stanford.edu slash entries, E-N-T-R-I-E-S, slash Hutchison, H-U-T-C-H-E-S-O-N. If you are interested in this, it was really not a difficult read, but I did need to print it out so I could write all over the page, a couple of pages, just to make this make sense to me. So I, I hope I did. I hope I didn't obfuscate that uh, too terribly much, because I think it's really Jane Austen just being freaking genius girl, and also I think really proving the point that this is a book written by a mature woman, not a young 20-something girl who who was interested in things and loved reading, but hadn't really been around this particular block. And Austin definitely had. So the perfection of virtue, I said there were some other things that are getting sub-referenced here. The perfection of virtue, that concept of perfection, is actually one of those other philosophical constructs that people were talking about at the time. So this was actually a, at least a double sub-reference, if not more than that. But I'm not going to get into the perfection thing. I think it's enough just to know. When Frank asks for something clever, Mr. Weston actually is pulling from something quite clever. What two letters of the alphabet are there that express perfection? that would have been kind of a trigger word for people at the time. They would have had a decent idea of what was coming if they were reading any philosophy of the time at all. The two letters that express perfection, M and A. I have no idea if any of the actors who have done these movies have done this deep a dive into it. Certainly the guy in the more recent Anya Taylor-Joy version seemed to understand after he said it, that he was making a joke that probably not everybody was going to get. He's such a lovely actor. I've loved him since he was in uh, A Room with a View. So I loved him then. I love him now. And he was in Sherlock. Anyway, uh, we we also got more of Mrs. Elton. Yeah, no, I can't. I can't do that. And and she fades out again into just kind of talking to Mr. Elton and not really, not really 
speaking to anyone else. She just, yeah, this is not my thing. I can't do this. I'm, I'm not the chaperone. I'm just, I'm going to walk. Now, Frank's behavior, as we heard from Leanne, Frank's behavior has been getting more and more reckless. And I think Leanne is absolutely right about the Dixon thing. And I also think Leanne might be right about Frank having met up with Jane on their own. Because there were a lot of times that Frank was, number one, going to the Bateses, and number two, Jane was going to the post office. But number three, there were lots of times where Frank just kind of disappeared. And we're not super tuned in to what's happening in the Bateses household. So that certainly gives ample opportunity for Jane to have found an excuse and for Frank to meet up with her because clearly stuff's going down. But at the same time, in what can only be described as a Rick move with a capital D, Frank does this thing about, will you find a wife for me? And that that could be funny because Emma's pretty much made it clear, even to him, she's not interested. She's, you know, she enjoys kind of flirting with him and and having fun with him. He's kind of the only one who can keep up with her in some ways when it comes to teasing, especially when it's not very kind teasing. But when he says she has to have hazel eyes, there is something just cruel about that. Because up until this point, his behavior for the last couple of days clearly has something to do with Jane Fairfax. She had to leave before he even got there because she had just had enough. So something had happened between the two of them. It must have been in a letter. And we don't have any backstory yet. But now he's basically making it sound like he's still hot for Emma. And Emma is trying so hard to fit this square peg into a round hole by saying, well, this is perfect. He wants me to choose a wife for him. I can do that. I know that secretly he wants Harriet and I know Harriet wants him. So I'm going to use this opportunity. And it's kind of weird that he came up with the hazel eyes thing, but never mind about that. Let's focus on him wanting me to set him up with a wife. So here she's been given huh, carte blanche. Uh, she's been being given the opportunity to do what she wants to do anyway and doesn't think twice about it. And I think part of the reason that she doesn't think twice about it is because, number one, the day has not been a good day and any entertainment is better entertainment than not, but also because it is what she thinks she's good at and enjoys doing. No matter what kind of promises she made to Knightley, she is still clearly interested in getting everybody happy. That maneuver by Frank, I, I think, is just, I know what's going on with him and Fra Jane Fairfax at this point. But if I were her, I think I'd be a little ticked off. And then Mr. Knightley gives Emma peace of his mind, as he should. We have seen him being kind of a, almost a, a moral guide to Emma in other ways and at other times. And he clearly does not relish this, but he also cares so much about her that I think him not speaking, not speaking up would have been uh, something he just couldn't, couldn't do. He really couldn't let this pass. Also because his, oh, his speech about Miss Bates and how she's, you know, fallen as far as society goes, she she it was a big deal for her to meet hold love emma as a little girl and now she is sunk in her her station in life and is going to probably sink lower because once her mother is gone we have no idea what kind of stipend she's going to be living off of but it's not going to be a lot there's obviously when we're talking about people at this time in this class with this amount of money there's always that layer of noblesse oblige the i'm rich and therefore my job is to make sure that my people in town are, if not taken care of, at least being paid attention to, cared for in some way. And boy, did Emma screw that one up. So nightly talking to her about not matchmaking, because everything else, it's, it's like she was able to blow it off as it was a victimless crime. 
well, I screwed up with Harriet, but she forgives me. This time there is a victim and Emma sees it and has to know it. And I thought the last paragraph of this chapter was important in several different ways. First, it starts with a single sentence, time did not compose her. So she's in the carriage going home. The passage of time is not helping. As she reflected more, she seemed but to feel it more. So she's doing that spiral thing where she's just replaying it in her head and is getting more and more miserable and it's just getting worse and worse in her memory. She never had been so depressed. These are not words that we attach to Emma depression. And I don't think we have seen her cry before. So when she says, happily, it was not necessary to speak, that's a single sentence, there was only Harriet, who seemed not in spirits herself, fagged, meaning she's tired out, and very willing to be silent. Well, now that's interesting. Because Harriet's often just kind of a happy-go-lucky chatterbox, like cluelessly chatterboxy. She did not not have a great time at the picnic, but we sure don't hear about her at the picnic, which means she's also not engaging. So whether it's the heat or whatever, something's off with her as well. And I think even more importantly, she heard Emma say this slight against Miss Bates. And That would be hard to watch your best friend, really your only friend in town of any merit. It would make you start to question how much you listen to, how much you trust, how much you follow. It's like finding out that somebody's been talking about you behind your back to other people. And when other people start to realize that this is behind your back, they start to think, oh my God, if that's what they're saying to me, what are they saying about me to someone else? I think there's a a certain amount of that going on in Harriet at this point. And then after uh, she was very willing to be silent, it's a semicolon. And Emma felt the tears running down her cheeks almost all the way home without being at any trouble to check them, extraordinary as they were. I don't, I don't think, not only do I think we haven't seen Emma cry in this book, I don't think Emma has cried. Certainly not a lot, but this one this one got to her. And fixing this one is going to be way harder than fixing Harriet. Justifiably, I mean, rightly so, it it should be. It should be something that she needs to make amends for. I think any of us who've had those, you know, 3 a.m. wake-ups when you think of, oh my gosh, I can't believe I did that. I can't believe I said that. I put my... I'm very limber. I can put not just one foot in my mouth, but I can put two in my mouth at the same time. So it's like badly done, Emma. Yoga is what I've done before. So I certainly know how that's been for me. I don't imagine there are too many people who haven't had that happen at least once. Once you're, you know, past the age of 30 and you've had a chance to really screw things up more than once. I love this ending because I don't feel sorry for her. I recognize that she gets it. This is a big deal and that's rough, but I I don't care that Emma is hurting at all. Sure care about Miss Bates. And I I know I have heard from several of you privately and and independent of doing call-ins and things like that, that this time around, uh, if you've read the book before, pointing out how Miss Bates is talking about what she's talking about and also the purpose that she serves in the larger narrative of the novel have made you a little bit more generous about Miss Bates because she totally can be annoying. But she's She's never a bad person. And Knightley's right. I mean, going after her, that was a cheap shot. I know that this chapter, her behavior in this chapter, is one of the things that make people not like Emma the book because Emma the person here is screwing up so badly. And so for me, the key to the entire book is this has to happen. If this didn't happen, if Emma didn't do this thing, it didn't happen to her, if if she didn't do this thing, she really might be irredeemable. Because how else is she going to learn a lesson? And that's that's true for so many of us in our early 20s and just, you know, trying to figure out how to adult. It's rough. It's not easy. 
And and Emma is proving that absolutely every moment of the day, that being clever, handsome, and rich is not necessarily a rubber stamp on your life being easy or good or you always being right. It makes people think that you might be, but Emma's a different thing. And I think that that, that feeling of not being happy with Emma hits a little close to home. If you know that you've done something like this before, this is an uncomfortable moment for her. And I think it should be an uncomfortable moment for us as well. I don't think Jane Austen is preachy, but I do think she wants people to reflect on their own behavior and on the people around them. Who are you surrounding yourself with? If you're surrounding yourself with people who could do what Emma just did, yeah, maybe maybe you don't need to hang out with that person for so much of the time. All right, so that is the Box Hill scene from Emma. Next week, we begin the repercussions. And just like we've we've talked about in the uh, before, the denouement, the end of the story, is the untying, which I always thought was very strange because you're not, why are you untying the end of the book? It should all be getting tied up neatly and put a bow on it. And it's untying the knots that we have created for ourselves during the previous part of the story. So we're going to see Emma have to untie a bunch of knots that she has created as we've gone through the book. And so that's that's going to be what what happens later. I don't like to think of it as a comeuppance because I think it's more important than that. And I I think comeuppance usually has some amount of shame that's being thrust upon you by others. The kind of you've made your bed now you have to lie in it, babe kind of attitude. I don't think this is a comeuppance. I think this is time to make amends. And I love that because it's hard. And if anybody can write it well, it's going to be Austin. And at the 11th hour, we got a voicemail from Teresa. Uh, So yeah, let's listen to what Teresa from Philadelphia has to say. Hi, Heather. It's Teresa from Philadelphia. I have never called in before, but I, Emma is one of my favorites of all of the Jane Austens. And I have a slightly different take on the conversation between Emma and Jane when Jane was explaining her sadness of spirit and need to, need to be alone for a while. I think that Emma, and perhaps you, because this is how you framed it also, um, interpreted Jane's despair wrongly. I don't think that Jane was so upset about the burdens of living with the date for Anne. I think the problem was that she had just spent the, the morning or the uh, the day with Mrs. Elkin, who has, who thinks of Jane as this great friend, but all she wants to do is find her an, um, a situation, which is the last thing that Jane wants. And I think that Jane is too polite and doesn't know how to escape from Mrs. Elton. And I think that that's what was really going on is that it's Yes, I think it is hard for her to live with her her aging aunt and to be in a situation where she doesn't know what's going on in her future. But I think that the immediate or the proximate cause of her despair at that point in time was Mrs. Elton. I think that's it. Thanks. So I think Teresa is probably right. And my read of uh, Jane Fairfax's needs, wants, desires is probably closer to what she's sharing with us. It makes a lot more sense, and it's a little bit more consistent with, I think, what we're seeing from Jane Fairfax, where um, she's clearly not a fan of Mrs. Elton, and Mrs. Elton keeps inserting herself. Plus, Mrs. Elton keeps trying to put her basically into a work situation that is less than desirable also, which would be not close to her family, the the Bates's family, and not close to the Campbells when they get back eventually from Ireland. So I think both Leanne and Teresa have some really good points today. So thank you both for sending those voicemails on to us. We appreciate it. 
All right. I hope you enjoyed this chapter as much as I did. I am going to go lie down. You go have a great week and I will talk to you soon. Have a great one. Bye. If you like what we do here, please consider liking and subscribing on iTunes, thumbs upping and subscribing on YouTube. You can visit patreon.com slash craftlit and become a patron of this art. And you can always go to Linktree, L-I-N-K-T-R dot E-E slash craftlit channel. And from there, you can get links out to all of the social media, all of the places that craftlit lives. It's it's a nice hub that you can go to to get all the stuff, all the good stuff. And I keep forgetting to mention, we also have a Facebook group with the loveliest group of people, as you might imagine. They're just awesome makers and readers and people who hadn't been readers before, but are now. I like that. All right. You take care of yourself. Have a great one. I'll talk to you soon. Bye. Thank you.